Welcome to Dogs with Torches. Today we are joined together with a returning guest, Dr. Anthony Bale, to discuss the social and literary phenomenon of medieval travel, as well as discuss Dr. Bale's new book, A Travel Guide to the Middle Ages. Dr. Bale is a medievalist who teaches at Birkbeck University of London. He has translated several works, such as the Book of Marjorie Kemp and the Travels of Sir John Mandeville. And he has written several works, such as Marjorie Kemp, A Mixed Life, and of course, his newest book uh, on medieval travel. He's won numerous academic prizes for scholarship in his field, and he's the former president of the New Chaucer Society. Dr. Bale, thank you so much for joining with us today. Thank you for having me. It's great to have you back on the podcast. The last time uh, you were on, we were discussing, of course, the book of Marjorie Kemp and some of the, the fascinating details about Marjorie Kemp's life. And now that you've written your second uh, book on uh, medieval travel and travel literature, what made you interested in writing and then and, and researching the, the, the themes of travel in the Middle Ages? Well, there were two things, that, two linked phenomena, really. One was that I'd been thinking about travel for a long time through the text you just mentioned, partly through Mandeville. I'd translated and edited that 10, 12 years ago. Um, and working on Mandeville had made me realise how popular that text was, how important it was, how influential it was, how long lived it was. It was one of the texts that Christopher Columbus took with him on that journey in 1492. Um, it was a text that Frobisher had. It was a text that people had into the 17th century as a piece of geographical knowledge. So we tend to think of Mandeville as a, you know, often erroneous, mistaken, foolish text, but it was a very influential description of, of, of the world. So I got very interested in that. And also I'd done some work then on readers of Mandeville who had used his book as actual travel literature, as travel guides. So they'd taken Mandeville's book on journeys to Italy or to the Holy Land with them. So I was very interested in the kind of reading experience of, of, of travel literature. And I thought this was something that hadn't really been appreciated in the general discussion around the Middle Ages, that there was still a lot of new evidence. There was a lot of exciting material that people would be interested in. And then at the same time, so there was a kind of literary and um, cultural phenomenon of it. At the same time, I decided to write the book um, and I started work on the book. I wrote most of the book during the pandemic when our relationship with travel changed completely. We'd become this culture, you know, in, in kind of the world globally, we'd become a culture where traveling across continents, traveling across oceans had become very normal. It had become something that was um, supported thousands and thousands of jobs and, and was a, a normal thing to do for lots of people. Many people I know were set up that their job was maybe in one country and they would commute on an aeroplane and things like that. They took that for granted. And then suddenly we couldn't leave our own homes. Mm -hmm. um, we, we And our relationship towards space and travel and the technologies of travel and um, the vistas of the world that we may or may not one day ever see again. Suddenly we were confronted with this idea that we may not be able to go to, you know, the country we'd always wanted to see or go back to our favourite beach or go to our favourite city. And so I started to think more about this, the relationship we have with travel as an idea and travel as a fantasy, what the way we all had to travel in our minds during the pandemic and imagine mm -hmm. places and be elsewhere, find ways to be elsewhere whilst being constrained. So yeah, um, they were two of the inspirations um, behind the book. Um, and I, I I started working with a very um, sympathetic editor, at, at, at two sympathetic editors at Penguin in the UK, Tom Killingbeck and Alpana Sajip. And, um, uh, and, and we came up with the idea of the travel guide to the Middle Ages, which 
introduced the world to a modern reader in medieval terms. So it was really indebted to Mandeville. And uh, it's a world which is um, partly historically true or archaeologically true, and partly a world which is imaginatively or narratively true. It's something which people read about but maybe didn't visit. And so it's, the book is playing with ideas of landscapes that you know in your heart versus landscapes that you know through your feet. Right, right, exactly. Uh, and it's really interesting that um, you draw so much on travel literature as it was written in the Middle Ages to uh, to write your book. If I can ask, what exactly was the purpose of travel literature? Because I, I, as I understand it, there was kind of a tension at times between travel literature as informative or instructive, as well as travel literature that was sort of written to promote curiosity and exoticism and, and those sorts of things and the 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 demarcation of what those two sort of genres subgenres were in in uh yeah. travel literature wasn't always explicit so the earliest travel literature in the kind of western christian tradition um they tend to be accounts quite bare bones accounts of the holy places or of the object of a pilgrimage and the purpose of those accounts tends to be to so the the writer can say that they've been there that they've seen it with their own body with their bodily eye but then the reader can imagine it in their mind's eye so someone who can't go somebody who's in you know iceland or ireland or spain or something who can't go to jerusalem can imagine that and recreate the journey in their in their soul in their in their mind mm. um as the genre develops, there's some new parts come to it, particularly in the 14th and 15th centuries. We get travel advice literature, which is much more concerned with the practicalities of travel. So changing money, um, illness, food, um, toilets, that kind of thing. And stuff which is very familiar to us from a rough guide or a let's go guide or that kind of thing from the modern um, travel guide genre. Um, and that's actually much more about helping future travellers plan their journey and make their journey an actual journey successfully. Um, and then there's the other side of that, which is rarer, more unusual, but um, is connected to curiosity um, and is connected to intellectual development. And this is intention with pilgrimage. Pilgrimage is supposed to be a directed teleological journey where you set off to go to your shrine and then you come back you don't start wandering you don't start kind of you know right being curious about what's on the way you don't go off the route you don't hang around um and then but you do start to find really it's a feature of of the mandevillian text but from the 14th century um ideas about distraction, ideas about mental edification, ideas about classical remains, um, non-Christian people, curious curiosities of nature, these things come in. And they, they're much more features really of 16th and 17th century travel writing, but they are definitely there from the 14th and 15th centuries um, as ways of thinking about travel as an encyclopedia of the world. When you write travel literature, you write a kind of encyclopedia of the whole world and of the of God's creation in the Christian sense. That there's there's curiosity, there's wonder, there's marvels, there's miracles, and they can include the observable, but also the imaginative, and that's very much sustaining travel literature. Very interesting. So, so okay. I, I, and that's a bit of a, a a a mixed answer to your question, but I'd say travel literature in the period I'm writing about, really in the 13th to the 16th century, is an emerging genre. It's not a stable genre. It's okay. coming into being, and it has lots of different features to it. But by far the most popular travel guides are, one is Mandeville's Book of Marvels and Travels. Um, another is um, the standard guide to the miracles and um, marvels of Rome, um, the Mirabilia, it's called, the, the Marvels of Rome. And another is um, Burkhard of Mount Zion's Travel Guide to Jerusalem, um, which focuses on the site, biblical sites and sites of the life of Jesus. 
Amon was the kind of standard Franciscan guide to Jerusalem. And these are texts which are copied both for practical travel and for reading in a cloister, reading at home, reading in a university. Um, and those two things are not intentional in the Middle Ages. You can read a travel guide at home or you can take a travel guide with you and then that's fine either way. Right, right. And with respect to the more pragmatic, practical side of, of uh, travel literature, what were some of the things that travel guides were advising uh, travelers or pilgrims? W were, were there any like, uh, were, were they careful to suggest safety measures for traveling or were engaging yep. with locals? Yep. So almost all travel guides in the Middle Ages include some glossaries um, for local languages. They're usually incredibly inaccurate and not to be attempted. Um, sometimes they will be languages which weren't even spoken there, like ancient Greek or biblical Hebrew um, in the in the Holy Land. Um, but sometimes we'll find interesting languages like Arabic or Albanian um, and, and Turkish written down, which seem to be based to some extent on interactions with local communities. So th th there might be most practical words like please, thank you, give me this, I need bread, milk, wine, staple foods. Then some of the glossaries we find say, say things like, you know, woman, wash my shirt, or give me a bed, or that kind of thing. Um, and so glossaries are, are, are very, very common. We also find lists of expenses. Um, these are very, very common. Um, the kinds of fees, um, you know, we all know that when you travel to a place for the first time, you end up spending so much more money than you thought because there's kinds of all kinds of hidden expenses and unexpected costs and things that you just haven't thought about. And that's true in the Middle Ages too, that particularly in the Holy Land, everything charge, everyone charges and everything costs money in the Middle Ages. And so there's you often get lists of either expenses or the costs to expect and often currency conversion lists, too. If you think about traveling from somewhere like England or the Low Countries um, to Venice and then across the Mediterranean, you are passing through dozens and dozens of different territories with different currencies. And there was no standard exchange rate. There was no standard currency. There were no travelers checks. There were no credit cards. And so you, so you were very much at the mercy of local currency markets. So there's often advice about that. Um, in some of the later texts, we also find people becoming more and more scared of um, criminality, banditry, um, sexual attacks. Um, these things, that's actually in Marjorie Kemp. She talks about her worry that she'll be, she will be right. assaulted on the route if she doesn't find a man and a group of other travelers to travel with. Um, and so there's some practical, these practical concerns, um, they're not unfamiliar to us, I think, as modern travelers, as contemporary travelers. They're broadly the same. They concern personal safety, food, money, lodgings, those kinds of things. Um, and we do see in the 14th century definitely quite an established set of infrastructures around travel to support travelers but also to to keep them safe and to take money from them and so in the book in the travel guides in the middle ages i include a lot of this material which is about you know kind of currencies or safety and whatever to give a sense of the travelers intimate experience of moving through the medieval world. We often approach the Middle Ages in a very kind of distant way, as a kind of top-down way, thinking about right. the whole experience, whereas travel writing gives you this window onto people's, you know, where are they going to find a toilet in Jerusalem? Where are they going to change money in Bruges? These, like, really basic kind of human human needs. Right, right. And and another thing that you... Uh... You, you illustrate it very well in the book about how the the concerns and needs of travelers will very often vary depending upon one's uh so one's place in this sort of social hierarchy uh so like uh, uh a countess or or, or 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 maybe a monastic might have different concerns than someone on the more peasant uh class so to speak yeah yeah I mean I think you you've, you've introduced a really interesting question here which is something I want to make really clear is that most people did travel. It was not something just for the rich or the leisurely, um, that it was very normal for very poor people to travel 
and particularly for pilgrimages, sometimes you could be told to undertake a pilgrimage as a, um, instead as a kind of criminal punishment, sometimes as a spiritual punishment, and, and sometimes on behalf of your community. So you might be, because you were, say, a, if you were a fit young man, you might be sent by your whole village to go to Rome on their behalf. Um, so it, you might actually be kind of, might feel like a punishment, but you were doing, it was actually a kind of compliment that you were being given by your community. But it was very common for people to travel, um, whether it was to the next town or, or to Jerusalem or Rome. Um, but yes, just like today, one of the first things when we start looking at planning our own travel your budget comes into place straight away, whether you're traveling economy class or business class, whether you can afford a one-star hotel or a five-star hotel, whether you want to share your space, your personal space, or whether you want more privacy. And these are all issues which are present in medieval travel too. You pay extra in a medieval inn to have your own room. You pay extra for someone to bring food to your room rather than eating at the common table. These things are you know, very familiar from medieval travel accounts where basically you buy comfort, you buy privacy, you buy um, safety to some extent. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that's a kind of, it's a feature of, I suppose, capitalism that it will find a market to, to, to exist in where there's spare spare money. Mm. Um, but also it, it connects to the sense that pilgrimage and business travel both started off uh, very much as group activities. And ideally they were quite leveling activities. Mm. In a pilgrimage, everybody should be traveling together and they should be traveling simply and devoutly. For business travel, say on the Silk Roads, you were traveling in a caravanserai with a group of people who may be from different places, speaking different languages of different religions, and but you were united by your desire to conduct business safely and um, regularly and get home alive. Once you start kind of peeling off and paying for privilege, you lose that kind of sense of corporate simplicity, and um, lots of my lots of the travel accounts they do make clear. I mean, that lots of them are about when things go wrong because that's more interesting than when things go right. But they are often about when people get separated from their group or when people, for one reason or another, end up traveling alone or in a small group, and that's when things tend to go wrong. Right. So was there a lot of, um, I don't want to say social pressure, because that kind of sounds like you're being coerced, but but what was there a lot of incentive to travel then in groups during the Middle Ages? I, I remember that that was always uh, a, a thematic concern for Marjorie, that like she's always worried that like her, her traveling group of pilgrims is going to ditch her and she's going to have to find her own way by herself. And I, I don't think it was social pressure so much. I think it was practical considerations. How do you know which boat is reliable? How do you know where it's sailing to? How do you speak all these different languages? How do you make yourself understood? How do you find the best inn or the best tavern or whatever? There's all these practical things which are which which which, which become very, very um you know necessary. Again, I mean I don't want to labor the point about it being like modern travel. But if you turn up in a place where you really don't speak the language and you can't even read the alphabet, um, you know, say if you've been to I don't know, Japan or, or China and you can't and there's no, no signs in English and you can't read their alphabet, then the only thing you can do is rely on strangers to for information. Right. Um, and that's very, very true in my in, in my sources. People often will rely on the on charity on random acts of kindness um from strangers um and that's perfectly fine in christian terms in the middle ages giving shelter to a traveler was one of the corporal works of mercy it was regarded as a um a, a, a religious uh, instruction to do that and as a good you know, as, 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 a, as a religiously defined good deed. 
And likewise, outside Christianity, outside Christendom, say on the Silk Roads, the, caravan the caravanserais were, um, were established um, to, and they were often free or subsidized by local princes, so trade could be carried out safely. They, they were part of a cultural sense of um, making travelers welcome and, and that being a, a good thing for a society to do. Um, but you needed to know where those were and, and you needed to travel in a group. I think there's, I mean, some of my travelers, um, they do meet sticky ends um, when they leave their their group and um, particularly in 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 the further in the further east where they're becoming um where they're doing more uncharted travel and more unfamiliar travel um then people don't do they they they, they, they find that they that their, their their goods are stolen um that sometimes they're attacked and some of them are put to death um and so there's a there's a strong um cultural sense of for safety for knowledge um, and to stay on the established path that you you stick in a group. Gotcha, gotcha. All right, then. Well, I figured maybe we could uh, sort of discuss some of the things that, that you go over in, in your book. One of sure. the things that, that you discuss is um, how the medievals envisage the uh, the different continents and, and and the globe, so to speak. Um, you actually talk about uh, the invention of uh, the the globe in Nuremberg by by this uh, by this man named Martin Beheim. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, Beheim and his uh, production of the globe? Well, I'm so glad, Hunter, that you've mentioned this because it's one of my favourite things to talk about. Um, and I love writing about it in the book and going to see it in the German National Museum in Nuremberg. I strongly, strongly recommend going to, going to see it. So this is a globe that was um made in the city of nuremberg which was one of the wealthiest most well connected most cosmopolitan cities in um in, in, in medieval europe and it was made by a man who as you say was named martin Beheim. um it means martin of bohemia his family were from bohemia and um the and Beheim's globe was made in nuremberg in 1491 in later 1491 1492 so it represents the globe just on the eve of columbus's journey to what would become the americas what become known as the americas um and so it's a really good um way of thinking about what we might think of our, as the medieval christian perspective on the world in the pre um atlantic um era um so it's a globe. It, it represents the entire globe as it was understood, but it has three continents on it, Europe, Asia, and Africa. And so as the globe is constructed, if you imagine sailing west from Portugal, the next place you meet is Chipangu, Japan. So it's as if the Americas simply weren't there, right. as if the Atlantic just became the... Pacific, if you see what mm. I mean, Pacific there either, um, and um, it also so it's it's the world as they knew it in in Nuremberg. Behind himself was a navigator and merchant working at the Portuguese court. He travelled very widely, um, and he lived actually between Lisbon and the Azores, um, and um, he'd also travelled a lot in Flanders and in Italy. Um, and probably in the in West Africa, in the West African coast, um, which was very, very quickly being charted by Portuguese navigators at this time. Um, the, but the, the globe, which was going to which was built to be displayed in the um, Rathaus, in the uh, town hall in Nuremberg. And it was in one way backwards looking as a kind of geographical source. And another way it's forwards looking because it promised the merchants of Nuremberg where you'd find the best pearls or the best um, spices or the you know, nutmeg or cinnamon, this kind of thing, um, or the best uh, gems or the best exotic woods. So the globe is poised between thinking about the world as it was known and the world as one might know it as a merchant. Mm. Um, and 
It's one of the earliest surviving European attempts to display the whole world on a globe. Now, this leads me on to another important point, which was that medieval people did not think the world was flat. Okay, so I just want to make that really, really clear. Um, and then Mandeville, again, in the 1350s, writes about this, but Behind's Globe makes this very clear. What people didn't understand in the Middle Ages was how you could circumnavigate it. They knew that it was a globe, but they didn't know how to get all the way around. Um, and so they just didn't know, have a boat or have um, the technology or the charted oceans to, to, to do that. Um, in my book, I talk a lot about um, medieval concepts of the end of the world, which almost all cultures have places called Land's End or mm. World's End or that kind of thing, um, and vanished worlds like Atlantis, which, you know, have have disappeared and and represent points where you can travel no further. But um, we know from medieval travel writing that, that um, lots of travelers would get to the Southern hemisphere beyond the equator and see the change in the stars. They'd see that they'd lose the pole star and start to see the Southern cross. And they would understand therefore that they were on the, what they would think of as the southern side of the world. Um, right. but, but and, and then they told a story about people who circumnavigated the world and ended up in a place where people spoke like their family and it turned out to be their family and they'd inadvertently wandered around the world. Anyway, I'm getting off track here, sorry. Um, uh, so Behind Globe is a really nice um, motif for imagining the world helping us imagine the world as medieval Europeans saw the world. It's very hard for us, I think, to think of the world without the Americas, without the Arctic, without the Antarctic, without Australia. Um, uh, but this, but the Behind the Globe doesn't show these places as absences, because even though they existed, it shows a full world, but just without them. And that's, we have to engage these sources on their terms. Right. You know, we can't say they were stupid, they didn't know about that, because the, this represents a huge body of knowledge based on thousands of years of inquiry. And this is up to date as as it could be in Nuremberg in 1491. Right, right. Now, with respect to the Nuremberg Globe, was it, did it have any sort of educational value? I know you said that, that it sort of functioned as like a, an encyclopedia for uh, merchants, but it, it didn't have the same function as maybe like a, a, a map that, 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 you, that you could use in your travels. Was it more so uh, a symbol of status or did, 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 did they actually use it pragmatically? Well, what, what can you say to that? I think it's, it, it does have some pragmatic purpose because um, King John of Portugal, who was Martin Behind's employer, he was very, very keen on exploring further for trade and for ultimately a kind of early colonial impulse on the Portuguese part to um, build an empire through trade. You know, the Portuguese had settled the Azores and had started to um, think about the African coast in terms of um, not an empire in a modern sense, but a, an empire of trade, let's put it that way. Okay. Um, and um, uh, so, yes, I think that... that it represents partly that mindset of expansion of European knowledge, but also you can think of it sitting in the town hall in Nuremberg as an educative um, tool, as a way for people to think about the world, um, to imagine a world that they wouldn't visit, to imagine vistas and locations that they would never manage to go to, and to think about where their own spices, their own jewellery, their own clothing came from. You know, they in a market in Nuremberg, you could buy nutmeg from Sumatra, or you could buy cinnamon from Sri Lanka. You could buy this stuff from all over the world. And so people were kind of thinking about a connected world, um, it, not in a kind of totally disembodied way, but actually thinking about where does, where does our, how does our world connect how does our world um, how is our world connected um 
And and then you think too about say um, you know, but behind sisters, they were nuns in Nuremberg. They were in a in a convent. They weren't allowed to leave mm. Nuremberg. They weren't allowed to leave. So how did they think about? The world, the globe brought the world to them rather than, you know, they couldn't travel to the, to, to, to across the Atlantic. Um, the globe also has on some moral stories around fantastical places, places from travel literature, places from imaginative literature. So it also has that kind of instructional purpose and has mermaids and, and sea monsters and that kind of thing painted on it. So it's also connected to, uh, uh, a more uh, um, domestic sense of wonder and the mor moral instruction of travel. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, then I figured maybe we could uh, switch over to discussing some of the popular destinations that um, travelers and pilgrims uh, uh, would seek after. But, but before we get into that, uh, one one more thing I wanted to, to mention. Uh, Another thing that you analyze and discuss in your book is the importance of um, pilgrimage badges. Um, that the, the, there was yes. a, a practice of pilgrims sort of showing that they've been to different places or experienced different uh, pilgrimage sites, and that they sort of collect these badges to show them. You know, why were these badges so popular in medieval culture? Badges, pilgrim badges, are souvenirs. They are basically souvenirs. Um, so they're no different from us buying. You know a piece of jewelry or uh you know something from a, a place that we visited and the, you know the origin of the word souvenir is something that helps you remember um so a pilgrim badge helps you remember where you've been it has a slightly different status in the middle ages as well um because it shows that you've been there yourself so it's proof that you've been to jerusalem or you've been to Aachen or wherever mm. um Pilgrim badges are perhaps the most common um, and widespread piece of travel evidence that we have. Um, they were very cheap, usually made out of alloy, lead alloy. Um, very, 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 very widespread. Almost every town which had a pilgrimage shrine um, sold badges in the 13th, 14th and 15th centuries. Um, very, very portable and easily lost so they often turn up in archaeological evidence um and we there seems to be some evidence that people wore them as status symbols you know i've been to rome i've been to jerusalem but also as good luck charms so um as well as you'll find pilgrim badges which show say the attributes of a saint um but you'll also find and um, pilgrim badges, and I've reproduced one of these in the book, which show kind of human genitalia, um, or um, you know that kind of thing. Um, they often called profane badges, and these may be good luck charms. They may be in images of the life force, which kind of um, stand for um, positive life, for, you know, and um, the new life promised through pilgrimage. Um, uh, and they, 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 these are again very, very, very common, particularly in France, the Low Countries, England, in the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries. So pilgrim badges are, I think, one of those points where um, the inner soul of the traveller, the inner personality of the traveller, takes on an outward expression, right. and you wear the pilgrim badge on your bag or on your hat or on your cloak as a sign that you've been touched by the pilgrim you've been sorry by the pilgrimage by you've you've been transformed by your travel um we know that at places like Aachen where the pilgrim relics were exhibited in a way where you couldn't touch them people sometimes had mirrors sewn into their pilgrim badges so the light could touch the relic and it would be like you touched it yourself um and whereas in other places um there were often stones or statues where you would touch the relic and might chip away a piece of the stone as well and take it away with you and then put it into the pilgrim badge in a you know kind of a, a, a frame right um so the pilgrim badge is really a very very widespread way of demonstrating contact and remembering the travels you've undertaken
one of the popular travel destination sites uh, that you discuss in your book is um, medieval Venice in Rome. Uh, what were some of the things that attracted uh, travelers and pilgrims to Venice in the Middle Ages? Well, Venice was simply the most important city for travelers in the Middle Ages um, because of its um, status as the main city of the what was then the Venetian Republic, which had a maritime empire stretching um, all the way to what's now um, the Greek islands. And then they also had um, trading posts in the Black Sea, in Alexandria, um, in the Holy Land, um, and really throughout the Silk Road. So the Venetian Empire was um, the most, it, it was a city built for coming and going, for travel, for trade, um, with a huge infrastructure for, for, for travelers and for, and for, and for commerce. Um, the Venice wasn't a religious destination, but it was the place where um, it, that served journeys to other religious destinations. So it became really the kind of node of, of travel um, by land and sea in, in later medieval Europe. Um, the other places that were most popular were what were known as the three great pilgrimage sites of uh, Jerusalem, Santiago de Compostela and Rome. And in the 14th and 15th centuries, Rome was a much smaller city than Venice. Um, it was, the population was smaller. It was quite um, kind of ramshackle. Um, a lot of the churches were, were in a bad state of repair, but it was spiritually an important place for Christians, obviously, to go to. Um, and, it, and it became increasingly um, popular for pilgrims after... Um, the fall of Acre in twelve nine in the in twelve ninety one, where the Holy Land became harder to get to, and Rome became much easier for European pilgrims to to visit. So, and then in thirteen hundred and thirteen fifty, the development of Jubilee years by Rome, where pilgrims got whole indulgences, they got whole um, pardons for their sins, um, which was basically, I mean belief aside it was basically a way of um encouraging as many people as possible to visit rome as travelers from all over christian europe mm -hmm. um so um yeah um venice was really i mean there were religious reasons that people found the time to spend in venice and it developed kind of relics and new pilgrimage churches but venice was really it really rose as a practical place as the center of European shipping and of European commerce. Um, whereas Rome was um, very much a religious destination. Rome had quite sophisticated infrastructure for travelers. There were, um, there was an English, yeah, but there were various um, hospitals or hospices for travelers, um, an English one, um, which is still the English college um, in, 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 in the center of Rome. And these existed as kind of expatriate hostels for travelers um, where their language would be spoken, their, 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 they'd, be, they'd be able to get good food and get a bed um, and get local knowledge. Um, and um, we know that, the, that, that Rome was really quite a popular destination for, 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 for all kinds of people. Um, the, the records of the English hospice still survive and they show that People from all over the British Isles were going there, often women with their um, women in kind of maybe sisters or a mother and daughter or widows um, educated men, soldiers, merchants, students, um, all kinds of people were going there. Um, and yeah, um, the, I think the, 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 there's a strong sense that um, Venice was... It was a bit like going to, I don't know, to Las Vegas or to, um, you know, Dubai today. It was this kind of, you know, it was fabulous shopping, wonderful architecture, amazing mix of people from all over the world. Maybe Dubai is the kind of better example. Um, a place built to come to and to leave from. It was a place, you know, where people travelled, passed through. Whereas Rome 
was a wonderland of religious experiences and familiar stories of, of the saints and of, 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 of the Bible. Um, we do see in Rome increasing interest in classical sites, but some pilgrims are totally um, oblivious to them. Right. Um, and they see it as really just as a religious a religious journey. Right. I, I like what you said about um, the, the interest in, in the classical, uh, a, a, a differentiated maybe from the religious significance. I, I remember, um, we might be jumping a bit ahead here, but I remember when when you discuss Constantinople and you talk about how a lot of the, the statuary of classical and late antiquity was on display. While yeah. we might be able to identify who's who as maybe a Roman emperor or, 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 or see the significance, that might not be what the average pilgrim would have seen or or, or experienced yeah i mean you, you you've you've led us onto a really interesting part of, well i found a really part, interesting part of the book to write which was a chapter about imagining constantinople in the 1420s um so this is christian byzantium christian constantinople when it was part of um the greek language speaking byzantine empire the head of the byzantine empire um so not the Islamic city it became after 1453. And we have um, a wonderful account of, um, of Constantinople um, by uh, a, a, a visitor called Bertrand Don de la Broquière, who described the city in a lot of detail. Mm. And one of the um, sites that he described and almost every traveler to Constantinople described was a huge equestrian statue. And actually Mandeville describes this as well. And this, this equestrian statue was kind of near um, near uh, Hagia Sophia and the Hippodrome, so right in the center of the historical center of Istanbul today. And um, it was an enormous kind of wonder of the world, if you like. Um, but what people didn't know was what it actually signified mm. and the accounts that travelers have give uh they are they're often in conflict with each other they about both the identification of the statue and even some of the details is it was the statue holding up a, a left hand or the right hand was the statue holding an apple or an orb in its hand or was had that fallen to the ground how big was it and Travellers often have to rely on what they're told or what they misunderstand, and that's true for all of us. Mm. Um, and in this statue, um, which I won't give it away by saying who it was of, um, but um, in this statue we see um, very um, diverse understandings of the ancient past and of the recent past as well, and of the meaning of these kinds of things. Likewise, Hagia Sophia which is a church dedicated to Sophia, Greek wisdom, was often understood to be dedicated to a saint called Sophie, um, a, a, you know, a female saint called Sophie. Um, and if you don't know what Sophia means, then that's a perfectly reasonable right. misunderstanding to make. Mm -hmm. And as many Western churches were dedicated to St. Margaret or St. Catherine, why not be dedicated to St. Sophie? Um, and um, yeah, um, also in the Hippodrome, um, if you go to Istanbul today, it's a remarkable place that you can you can see. It was a an ancient stadium for um, gladiatorial contests and for animal fights and that kind of thing and for races. Um, but there were several ancient statues there, which some of which are still there, and travellers didn't know what to make of them. Um, mm. And so often people are very curious about them um, and would often make up things about them or tell stories about them. Um, and sometimes they would have an archaeological impulse. Sometimes they would have an entirely fantastical impulse. But this Byzantium, Constantinople, is exactly on that seam of something which is familiar or something which is alien, something which is unfamiliar. And so travellers are, and they're in a Christian world, but it's not a Christian world which is Right. Exactly. Their kind of Christianity. And it's and it's yeah, um, it's a it's a contact zone, a liminal zone between Europe and something else. I really enjoyed how uh, you brought up uh, Bertrand and de la Broquière, who, who um, 
what's interesting about him and his sort of travel into Constantinople is he sort of gives a Western conception to what he's experiencing in sort of Eastern Constantinople. He he sort of tries to tie his knowledge of the area back to sort of Western concerns, like the, the, the presence of the Crusades, the sack, things like that. Um, I always thought, I, I really thought that was interesting how, how it's Brendan trying, or not Brendan, I keep saying Bre Brendan. It's, it's Bertrand Bertrand Brendan yeah. Yeah. trying to understand this place that is Constantinople. Yeah, absolutely. And don't forget, there was also in Constantinople itself um, a suburb, um, Beoglu today, but then Kera or Galata, um, which was the Genoese exclave and was effectively a kind of Western European suburb um, of the Byzantine city. And we get the sense from Bertrand Dunn and from other travellers that you'd go there to feel at home. You know, you, you, mass was said in Latin mm. in a church which looked like it was in Italy or France. And, the you know, the shops, the food, the, the gossip. People asked him there about Joan of Arc. What's happened to Joan of Arc? They were kind of, you know, they the, the news was travelling between Western Europe and, and, and Galata. And it was much more... You know, th this was a, a suburb that was designed to um, make Western Europeans feel and be at home in a way. Um, and, and the Eastern Mediterranean was full of places like this. Rhodes occupied a very similar um, role um, and, and to some extent so did so did Jaffa um, until the, the fall of the Crusades. Mm. Right. I, I really like how you mentioned uh, how how once it got wind that uh, Bertrand Dunn was was part of like a Burgundian court, they all started wanting to ask about Joan of Arc. And it, it sort of just shows that even though that when we think of Byzantines, even Byzantine studies as a discipline today, we sort of see it as like distinct from or separate from maybe like uh, the study of like Western European Middle Ages. It is interesting to see how how a lot of the concerns and a lot of the intrigue tend to overlap with these two cultures. Yeah. And um, travel is all about um, interconnection. Even if you resist it or you misunderstand the things you're seeing, you are in one way or another interpenetrating and being interpenetrated by the places and the people and the influences and the ideologies that you encounter as a traveler. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, the, the, it's not always harmonious or equal, but travelers, um, they, they, they have interesting, um, it's, 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 they record contact rather than separation. Right, right. And well, maybe that might be a good, uh, uh, segue into discussing a, another uh, place that you that you go into the the holy land as as a pilgrimage site you know what did medieval people usually mean when they designated the holy land usually when we think of the holy land we think of maybe jerusalem specifically but as i understand it it sort of included many other areas and places of worship that were included in biblical narratives yeah and um, to mandeville it's a great question hunter mandeville says that the holy land kind of stretches across the entire area covered by the biblical tribes of Israel. Um, then there's other terms like Syria, which is often used to mean the entire Mamluk empire from Egypt to what's now Southern Turkey. Um, uh, Promised land, holy land, um, Judea, these different terms used for this. Um, Kingdom of Jerusalem. Um, the Holy Land tends to be the most you, most common term, and it's the one that's used in the later Middle Ages. Um, and um, really it means the land around Jerusalem that has sites, in, in a Christian terms, it, that, that has sites connected to the life of Christ and the saints and, uh, and the Bible. Um, and so people are not interested. If people go to Alexandria or to Gaza or to um, Beirut, they're going for mercantile reasons. Okay. They're going to do business travel. If people go to Bethlehem or Nazareth, they're going for religious reasons because they're mentioned in, in, in the Bible. Um, 
sometimes people will stay in those first group of places on their way to the other places. So there is a crossover between them. But really, you know, to for a medieval Christian or Jew from Europe, to travel to Jerusalem was one of the most spiritually beneficial and culturally prestigious journeys one could make. Um, and so there's a huge body of writing about, about this journey, about the pilgrimage to Jerusalem. Not all pilgrims are sincere pilgrims. Some of them are going for profit. Some of them are going to escape from something bad happening at home. Some of them are going to get drunk and have sex and to have a holiday. You know, so, so, so we can't, you know, I'm not being kind of heretical there. And that's just what the sources tell us. Not all pilgrims go with a pure heart and a good intention. Others do. And others find that they are disappointed by the Holy Land, that it's much more difficult than they expected, that they can't understand why um, it's it's ruled by Muslims. Why? How can this be that the land that's promised by God to Christians is, is, is not um, owned by them, not governed by them? Um, they also find that it's not like the pictures that they've learned from the, their, their books or from mm. their paintings. You know, if you look at a medieval picture of Jerusalem, it's kind of, it looks like wherever it was painted, it looks like a Spanish picture of Jerusalem looks like Spain. A Flemish picture of Jerusalem looks like Flanders. Right. Um, but actually they were amazed to discover that the, it was unbelievably hot um, and, that, and that it was the desert and that the water was dirty and that the food was not plentiful and that the locals were hostile. You know, that, that, and, and this was not what they had been educated in their religious literature to expect. Um, Jerusalem from the 1320s, um, the Franciscans set up a, a an organization which still exists called the Custodia Terra Sancta, which is effectively a kind of holy travel agency for to facilitate pilgrimages to Jerusalem mm. and the holy sites, based in Jerusalem and Bethlehem in particular. And um, from the 1320s, they set up a kind of understanding with the Mamluks that they would do guided tours starting in Jaffa um, and going to Jerusalem and Bethlehem. But they would; these would be very, very closely determined trips. You weren't allowed, people weren't able to wander off on their own. They were group right. tours. That they, they had a set itinerary and. There's long and detailed accounts, I include one or two of them in the book, of people waiting at Jaffa at sea for the Mamluk authorities to allow them to disembark. And there they would take their names, they would take they would take money from them. And it was a very, very well-organized, closely surveilled trip. It was not a kind of gap year right. voyage of discovery. Miami it was very right. much. No, it was it was very very much a um, a, 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 a predetermined itinerary. Um, the the accounts we have of Jerusalem tend to be very very detailed, um, and I could have written the whole book about just Jerusalem, um, about medieval Jerusalem, and and its role in travel writing. There's a lot more to be said about it, and a lot more sources that haven't received much much um attention um but that they 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 cover both the religious experience of going into the church of the holy sepulchre or going around the the mount of olives and the very practical experiences of getting food of um being having stones thrown at you by local children of where you sleep that kind of thing so there's there's that very characteristic interplay between the spiritual and the practical. Right. One of the interesting things you discuss is um, this specific destination of, um, it was sort of called a Crusade Acre or Crusader Acre. Uh, uh -huh. What can you tell us about, about this destination and its importance for, so, for pilgrims? Acre, Acre, Acre is, a, is still a, a city now in northern Israel, um, which was a Crusader... Um, port uh, set up in the well really expanded in the 12th century and it had um, separate quarters for the Knights Temple, the Knights Hospitaller, um, Pisans, Genoese, Venetians, um, Provencal, English 
There were all, so it was a very international city, and it was effectively the Crusaders' port. It's between, um, effectively between, say, um, Jerusalem and Beirut. Um, after Jerusalem was conquered in 1190, the Crusaders set up Acre as their capital um, when the Crusaders were kicked out of Jerusalem. And so Acre for 100 years was the main Crusader city. And in 1291, Acre too fell to the Muslims um, and, the, and the Christians then moved to Cyprus and to Rhodes and ultimately um, were expelled from the Holy Land. Acre was... A phenomenally, a phenomenal kind of um, 13th century acre was a phenomenal um, European project to build a city, a European city in the Holy Land as a stronghold, as a foothold on the Mediterranean coast. Um, this, the remains that you can see today are incredible, particularly of the um, the Hospitaller Fortress, the churches, the walls, um, because it was never reoccupied by the Mamluks. The Mamluks left it ruined and destroyed mm. most of it because they didn't want it to be reoccupied. Um, and um, it's it's an ama it's an amaz amazing place to visit today. It gives a very strong sense of Crusader of a Crusader city. Mm. Um, Travelers who wrote about it, they write about its culture, about its wealth, about its mixed population, about the cosmopolitanism of, of Acre in the 13th century. Um, but they also have this thing which we see a lot in travel writing. They can't imagine it'll ever be any different. They imagine it's going to be there forever. But it was actually a very short-lived city. And so one of the things you find, this is true also of Constantinople or of other places I write about, is that people imagine when they travel somewhere that it's that their experience is going to be the experience of everyone, yes. the future generations. And then, of course, what we can do as historians is, with the benefit of hindsight, is to see that they actually gave us a snapshot of that place at a very specific and quite unusual moment in time when they uniquely had access to that to that right. that place. Right. And then another interesting thing that you analyze is that a lot of the literature that's written in the context of travel in the Holy Land, it sort of gives us a window into Western Christian conceptions of Islamic religious practices. Um, um, mm -hmm. I think one of the people that you, well, I think one of the uh, travelers that you discuss in your book is uh, Conrad, uh, Conrad uh, Grunenberg. Grunenberg, yeah. And, and how yeah. he, when he's trying to... Uh, find out more about the the uh the religion of islam he comes away with all these all these sorts of like weird fantastical tales about like flying sarcophagi of of, of muhammad and, and sort of all sorts yeah. of weird beliefs and yeah um i mean I, that some a lot a lot of the travelers are i think surprisingly i mean Travel writing tends to be a place where misunderstanding is rife. Um, there's certain kinds of hostility and judgmentalism about other cultures that we find in travel writing. That's to be expected. That's what travelers do. Um, but some of my sources, I think, are surprisingly, they're interested to know what other faiths, other communities, other cultures do. They want to understand the world they're traveling through. They're often at the mercy of misunderstandings or of rumor or of gossip or whatever. Um, Grunenberg, yeah, um, is 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 a um, is, is 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 an interesting case because he he as he travels down the coast of what is now kind of Croatia, Albania, Greece, Islam becomes more and more. So his journey starts off as a kind of pleasure cruise where they're basically having a great time they're partying on the boat the sailors are kind of playing music they're drinking and dancing it's all great and then as they go further and further east they become more and more aware of conflict of mixing of the turks being close by and there being battles and that kind of thing and having to pay tribute so he he tries to um find out some stuff about Islam. When he's in the Holy Land, he finds a Jewish 
um, Palestinian, um, a Jewish Arabic speaker, a local Jew, um, who um, he asks to translate the call for prayer, the Islamic call for prayer for him. And he clearly had read some, Grunenberg had read some Western literature about Islam and also again mix that with his observations and with what some other people on the trip had told him. And he knew that Muslims, for example, made pilgrimages to Mecca, what he calls al Mega. Um, and then he repeated this story about Muhammad's body flying around in a coffin. This was actually a Western um, mockery. I'm not a really, well, yeah, it was a really a, a, a mockery of, of, of Islamic practices, but through putting Christian practices into um understanding of Muhammad's life right. and um, it was because it was normal in Western Europe to have things like crucifixes which were suspended in the air or for um, saints bodies to work wonders after mm -hmm. they had died Muhammad's coffin was said to fly around as a kind of posthumous wonder um, so it's not really a mockery in in an anti-Islamic sense. It's more of a kind of misunderstanding or an importing of right. Christian ideas around that um, into into Muhammad's life. Um, anyway, so um, they they um, Grunenberg was kind of he was curious about what the power of Islam was. A lot of travellers um, talk about the sincerity of Muslims and the. Um, the 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 um devotion of Muslims compared to the laxity of Christians mm -hmm. that they they see in Islam a rigor and a um obedience that they think Christians should learn from and that would actually mean they say they would get the Holy Land back. Muslims have got the Holy Land because they are so um devout. And if Christians were half as devout and half as obedient, then they would get that, the Holy Land back. So they often look at Islam as a way of thinking about their own their own failings. Two other places of travel that you discuss uh, in your book, the, the sort of Silk Road uh, web, and of course, uh, what was understood to be Ethiopia. What can you tell us about, um, maybe we'll start with Ethiopia. What can you tell us about sort of Western conceptions about Ethiopia, or, or what exactly did, did, did medievals even mean by Ethiopia? Because as I understand it, sometimes when they speak about Ethiopia, it's just a name for all of Africa. Yeah, I, I mean, Ethiopia was very, um, in the European imagination, it was um, very poorly defined. And yes, it could mean basically most of Africa. Um, or certainly it, it was often used to describe all of Africa that wasn't Morocco and um, Mauritania and Egypt, anything kind of below that was kind of thought of as Ethiopia. Um, Ethiopia, in a, put, put simply, was whatever Europeans wanted it to mean in the European okay. um, imagination. But it, it was a destination for some European travelers um, and particularly from Venice and Italy, um, there were it was and it was a Christian country, um, and so travelers to Rome and Jerusalem might uh, might have met or seen Ethiopians, Ethiopian Christians, um, and that there were em there were embassies and diplomatic and religious um, con contacts between Europe and Ethiopia in the fourteenth and fifteenth century. Don't forget as well that Ethiopia is a biblical um, biblical place. That mm. The Queen of Sheba was said to have travelled from Ethiopia um, to Jerusalem to um, to King Solomon, and 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 there's there's often in medieval accounts of the three magi, a black Ethiopian mm. mage who 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 came from Ethiopia. So um, Ethiopia was this kind of ill-defined land. Ethiopia connect, connects with a very prevalent medieval myth of a ruler called Prester John, who had been imagined to be in India and then in Ethiopia, who was a Christian ruler, a lost tribe of Christians, if you like, who was waiting to make an alliance against the Muslims somewhere yeah. else in the world. Um, and travellers often talk about Prester John, John the priest, in their accounts of Ethiopia. And even when 
people visited Ethiopia, that's how they often talked about 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 um, the the ruler there. So Ethiopia is kind of ill-defined, um, sometimes defined through its nature, its weather, um, but also sometimes positively defined. And it's not necessarily a, um, a an alien or frightening place for European. It's sure. European. It's a place of desire. It's a place of wishing to make contact with the Ethiopians. Would you say though that a lot of the literature that was that that, that, that was written uh, describing Ethiopia seems to bear the the character of a kind of Orientalism, though a sort of like projecting of conceptions of what they think Ethiopia consists in? Or, I mean. <sighs> It depends on your definition of Orientalism, because what we don't find is um, there's no sense of um, of people wanting to 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 own Ethiopia sure. land at this point. There isn't sure. the imperial um, subtext of lots of understandings of Orientalism. Um, people are interested in various ways about the black skin of Ethiopians. Um, the the word Ethiops comes from the Greek for burned visages, burned faces. Um, and people understood, this was part of a kind of theoretical discussion about where blonde hair comes from and black skin. And there, it is in, influenced by the weather. It's influenced by where one lives on the equator. And medieval theories of the climates understood that the closer you got to the equator, the more you were likely to be burned by the kind of um, intemperate zones that you were living in this kind of torrid zone that they called, as they called it, that you were living in where the weather got very, very hot. And ultimately, if you went further and further, it became uninhabitable. Um, so they thought that Ethiopians were black because they were, um, they were burnt by the sun. Um, that is, it's not, um, so, but it's not, I mean, so it's race, it's it's a race theory of sorts, mm. but it's not necessarily tied to an, an imperial sense of racial um, subjugation or racial sure. superiority. Um, so I think it's, it's very, very, it's very hard to say. I mean, I suppose there is a colonial um, impulse in finding Prester John and making an alliance with him mm. and the sense there's a Christian empire out there. Um, but this also tends to be, this is a kind of meta-Christian myth. It's not a sure. nation-based myth. Okay. And then what can you tell us about uh, the Silk Roads uh, in the Middle Ages? Uh, obviously, the, the term Silk Roads, I think, you, yeah, you made a point to mention in, in your book that they are something of a 20th century invention yeah. of describing this this network of, of trade routes. Yeah. But what it's can you say? It's a 19th and 20th century term, and it was never one road. So we can't imagine that there was some people in kind of China sending their silk along one road. And if that was broken, the China the, the silk couldn't get through. It's a network of ports, of route roads, of caravanserais. Caravanserai is a kind of fortified hotel. Um and 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 on and of and of different structures, bridges, um dipl diplomacy contacts that set up a web really from Venice and Barcelona in the West all the way to Japan in the East. Um, and, and Silk Roads operated really as kind of in kind of relays. So say spices from, from Java or Sumatra would then travel along these Silk Roads um, or by sea. Um, there was a kind of maritime route via Aden and um, uh, Yemen um, and via um, the Red Sea in the and 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 and, and, th and that way, but the land Silk Road we would travel in relay. So you would send something off to I don't know to to China, and then that would travel into Central Asia, and then into Persia, and then into the Holy Land, then into the Black Sea, or and then to Alexandria, and then into Europe. And each time, it you, people would be paying. For a consignment, and so it was a quite complicated system, um, and it wasn't just silk traded along this route. It was also spices for medicine, cookery, jewels, beverages, animals, um, dye, soap, um, furs, um, caviar, mercury, henna, all kinds of things 
um, being traded along with us. And things traveled in both directions. Say English wool traveled from the West to the East, just like silk traveled from the East to the West. Right. Um, and this, and it's in the Silk Road that we find both um, the kind of origins of merchant, um, of, of kind of business travel and the business traveler, um, but also in um, banking and trading operating over a huge distance. Um, so these companies like the Alberti, the Bardi, the, um, the, the Italian banking companies setting up um, their um, banks, their trading houses across the Silk Road and missionizing, get a lot of travel writing from Christian missionaries. Mm, right, right. And then the Silk Road connects to Tartar and Mongol empires in what is now China. Um, so it really does give us that connection between Europe and the widest conception of the world going all the way to the Antipodes, um, Java, um, the and what's kind of connected to Australia today right. um, through, through through business, through trade. Oh, absolutely. And and I, I wish we had more time to discuss it, but like you go through, uh, like there's a whole nother world of like India, India and Antipodes and all these sorts of places. Yeah. I wish we had more time to discuss it, but maybe no you've got to read the book <laughs> i know exactly exactly I, well that, that that's maybe my my sort of closing question um this has been a really good interview dr Braille. thank you so much if if i can maybe ask a closing question do you have any book recommendations for those who'd want to learn more about medieval travel or travel literature obviously we we have this very beautiful very very ornately uh written uh book travel guide to the middle ages but do you have any other sort of recommendations uh my strong recommendations would be to go back to the sources themselves. And I've included a very long list of those sources. And you can read something like Mandeville's Travels or Felix Fabry, a wonderful Swiss-born pilgrim who writes a very gossipy, fun account of his journey. Or um, um, Bertrand von Brockier or Bernard von Bredenbach, um, Marjorie Kemp. Wonderful voices um, from the Middle Ages that tell us a lot about their travels, a lot of detail, a lot of personality, a lot of colour. Um, and there's really a huge array of these sources, many of which are not well known. So I think going back to the or original sources, many of them are in modern English translation. And it's a really fun, accessible, interesting, varied body of body of sources. All right. Well, Dr. Bale, this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much for coming on. You're incredibly welcome, Hunter. It's great to speak with you.